So I just wanted to do an update and thank you, first of all, old patrons and new patrons from the bottom of my heart for your support. With your help, I've been able to and inspired to keep doing these videos, one after the other, one a week. I've also been able to get 150,000 words, which is like 500 pages. As my mom says, it's not world and war and peace. 150,000 words, 500 pages into um, my novel, which is a masterpiece in the making, I assure you. I think it's okay. It's not a masterpiece in the making, but I hope it's readable at least. It takes all of these Zen themes that I've been talking about and it puts them in a the context of basically a fairy tale from the future. So a folk tale, it's like a folk tale from the future. And it's discussing, boy, AI, this AI topic is really big right now and I feel like it really fits in with what I'm working on in this novel. And Zen and the intersection between spirituality and technology. And it does it in a funny way. There's a talking teddy bear and a guy loses his virginity to a bioengineered version of himself. There's an internet in it, but it's on the outside. There's an actual place. We call it the art hole. It's told in four sections, and I'm coming to the end of section three. The past couple months, I haven't put a ton of writing up on Patreon because I've been working almost exclusively day and night on this uh, novel project. So your support here has allowed me to do that to some extent, so thank you. And I look forward to posting chapters at some point here on uh, Patreon. Okay, secondly, I wanna talk again about monthly meditations or bi-monthly meditations. So I did this for a little while, uh, about a year and a half ago on Patreon, like by, by, by a few months into Patreon, I started doing uh, uh, weekly sits. I, I did them bi-weekly or weekly and I did them on Sundays. So I started off the first one or two of these sits, meditation sits. So I mean, what I'm talking about is that we, we, would, we, would, we would, I would sit with patrons. We, we would do like two sits. They were 25 minute zazen meditation sits, uh, you know, in the moment live. And then there was like some Q and A in there. Um, so I did two of these on YouTube streaming, right? And then a, a patron very generously donated a Zoom subscription, okay? So that we could like share sitting together. Okay, I'm gonna be honest, here's what happened. I did my first one of those and I looked at my computer screen and I saw like all these faces staring back at me. And I had, I, I couldn't quite admit it at the time, but I had mixed emotions about this. For one thing, I just kind of got stage fright. That's true. Uh, right now I'm looking at my, my, my iPhone. I'm in an empty room. I'm not live, you know? I can edit this. I'm not generally an extroverted person like this, you know? It's just, so when I saw those faces, looking at me, I, it was like too much. And it also brought back memories of giving Dharma talks at our temple in Los Angeles and up on the mountaintop monastery. And this feeling of having to take responsibility for other people's practice for a Sangha. And it brought me back into that zone of teacher guy. Like I started to feel like a little bit, I, I tend to, when I'm in an environment where there are, I'll take responsibility, I'll take a lot of responsibility. And, and I, I, I wasn't comfortable with, with that. I, I don't like that role of teacher guy. And I know I put this all on myself and that it's insane and absurd, but for some reason, seeing these faces made me panic, okay? And, and, and the other thing is, I was looking at these faces and honestly, 
a lot of a lot of them were older than me, more experienced, had been probably practicing longer, and I felt like I don't like taking questions from, you know, peers, frankly. That's how I think of all of you guys. You're my peers. We're peers, you know? And that peer dynamic got diluted by seeing all the Zoom squares of faces, seeing all these experienced, intelligent. I think the people that are my patrons are highly intelligent. I don't know what that is, but I get DMs from you and I read your comments and you're thoughtful, smart people. So this is a peer group. So I stopped doing, I just quit doing these monthly meditations, but I think monthly meditations are a good thing. It's it with a group. And like you guys are my sangha, really. Um, the reason it's good is because it's, it connects you, it connects you, it's a tool. A sangha is a tool. Sitting with people is a tool. I do it by myself, but it's, it's just different. And it's great practice by myself, so I recommend sitting by yourself. But it's good to have a sangha too. So I've been thinking about doing it again, but I don't want to do it through Zoom. And already I wasted that subscription. It just ran out. So uh, stupid. Um, but I would like to do it again through YouTube. Maybe once or twice a month, just I read a ton. I've always got good stuff I can read about meditation beforehand, offer a few thoughts as we get settled in to our meditation sit. Then we do like two 20 minute sits, 20, 25 minute sits. Then you can, I'm thinking we do it on YouTube live. So then you can just text me, you know, message, message questions and I can answer any Q and A really more than anything. It's just, it's just a way to connect and a, and, um, a way to sort of, of, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come at you like answer guy, but it's good. To, people flow questions, and we can talk and, and think together. I think maybe once or twice, twice a month, doing this with patrons, I think it would be beneficial. But I don't, I don't want to overpromise or anything. So I'm doing this. I just want to get your feedback on it. What you think about that? You can message me. Um, you can comment on the Patreon video right here. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. The other thing I'm thinking about doing is some kind of guided meditation series for just for patrons. Um, and I never have done guided meditation before. I have never done it and I've never um, given it, right? Because in Zen, your breath is your guide, your surroundings is your guide, the situation is your guide. If somebody's talking at you, it's, it's not really Zazen, it's guided meditation. But okay, so then maybe guided meditation. I think, that's, I think that can be helpful for people. I see people everywhere, everyone I talk to is doing like Sam Harris's waking up app or the 10% happier thing. Um, there's the, there's the, that guy, Andy Puttycomb, what, who's that guy? The guy who does that very, very famous mind space, I think it's called. So, you know, there's something to these guided meditations. People need a little bit of help. And you know, there are oftentimes when I'm lying down and I'm doing like lying down meditation because my back hurts and I'll be listening to some Buddhist teachings. So I think it's helpful. So if you have any thoughts on a guided meditation series, DM me or leave some comments here in this section. I'm, uh, I, I, I think that could be helpful, but I'm not, I could be wrong. Maybe you don't want that. What, what I was thinking of something along the lines of just basic Zazen guided meditation, uh, maybe something along the lines of you're feeling very stressed, guided meditation, guided meditation if you have an, an intention, by which I mean sometimes I'm, I'm like working on this novel, for example, and it's in my head and I'm sort of stressed about it and excited about it and activated by it on the inside. So I know if I sit down and I do my meditation, I'm just going to be working with this book. So I'll have an intention to work with this book during my sitting practice. And, I, and while it's not straight zazen, we can't confuse the things. I try not to confuse the things. Sometimes I just need to use meditation to help make my life a little bit better, a little bit more productive, a little bit less stressful. 
Uh, maybe I have an emotional issue that I'm working on, something that's really got me stirred up. The intention can be to sit with that. So kind of like the, the thing that I'm thinking for, this, for, for these guided meditations would be something along the lines of intentions, sitting with an intention. Again, I'm really just floating this. It's something that's been in my head, but I, I, I thought I would give it to you all and see what you thought and see what you think and see if it could be helpful. That's it, that's all I got in closing. Thank you again for your help, for your wisdom, for your insights. I guess this is the point where I'm supposed to make some kind of joke about the Dalai Lama asking to suck on your tongue, but I don't have a joke and it's not appropriate, so I won't do that here. It is kind of interesting though, isn't it? It's like, what was he thinking? What is going on there? My friend Mimi, Mimi the Yogini, we did a great interview together. I hope we do another one in the future. Mimi, are you out there? Pack your coffers with good stories. We need to do another interview. Maybe we can talk about uh, Tibetan uh, monastic culture because you spent time in Tibetan monasteries. And Mimi has told me that like the, the mindset is so different. The, the cultural air that is breathed in these Tibetan monasteries that she's lived in are so different. She was in Nepal, but Tibetan practice are so different than anything in the West. And she said like, you know, it's, it's like their personal boundaries are gone. I mean, she tells a story once about how she was on the bus and this woman just used her body as a scaffold to pick herself up off her seat. Didn't even ask Mimi, just like grabbed her. She was an older woman and Mimi was standing and the woman was sitting down and the woman just reached up and grabbed her and climbed up onto her feet using Mimi's body and didn't even say thank you or excuse me. And just kind of pushed Mimi out of the way and left the bus. So Mimi's point was, and I'm completely um, butchering your stories here, Mimi, I'm sorry, but this is how I remember them. Um, what one, thing, one thing that Mimi told me was that in these monasteries, there are just hordes, dozens, hundreds, thousands of kids, boys, young boys, and they have such a different sense of, of boundaries and personal space than we do. She said these guys just, they sleep together, all sleep together, and they, they, they'll be cuddling up next to each other, not thinking twice about it, kissing each other on the cheek. So there's very different sense of personal boundaries. I wonder if there's not something like that going on with the... Dalai Lama asking this young boy if he could suck his tongue. I didn't follow the story too deeply. I just didn't want to go there. But I think it, he, he made some sort of gesture that he wanted to suck on the boy's tongue. Don't know why I brought all that up and I, don't, I feel like I shouldn't close on that. So we're gonna close on something from the Blue Cliff record instead. You ready? Let's do it. Bibliomancy, isn't that what they call it? When you just grab the Bible, you open it to a random page, you read it, and then that says something about your future. It's like throwing the coins in I Ching or reading coffee leaves, reading tea leaves. We're gonna do it right now. This is our bibliomancic moment for Patreon. Okay, ready? Here it is, page, oh, Chao Chu's newborn baby. A monk asked Chao Chu, does a newborn baby also have the sixth consciousness? Chao Chu said, it is like tossing a ball on swift flowing water. The monk also asked, asked Tao Tzu, different than Chao Chu, what is the meaning of tossing a ball on swift flowing water? Water. Tao Tzu said, moment to moment, nonstop flow. As a follow up, I'll give you um, the commentary on this, which I don't, don't have time to go into what the commentary and all that is in the Blue Cliff record, which is also the Hekagon Roku, which is a collection of classic contexts. We're going to close on this. This is good. Um, it says, although a newborn baby is equipped with the six consciousnesses, though his eyes can see and his ears can hear, he doesn't yet discriminate among the six sense objects. At this time, he knows nothing of good and evil, long and short, right and wrong, gain and loss. A person who studies the path must become again like an infant. Then, 
praise and blame, success and fame, unfavorable circumstances, and favorable environments, none of these can move him, or her, or they, or them, or Z. Though his eyes see form, he is the same as a blind man. Though his ears hear sound, he is the same as a deaf man. He is like a fool, like an idiot. His mind is m as motionless as Mount Sumeru. This is the place where patch-robed monks like you and me really and truly acquire power. Damn, I'm glad we did this. Till next time. Mm.